you know, Friday the 13th in the movie theater, you would wander by the morgue and, and look at all the people who were on display who were dead. Um, this doesn't happen anymore. And, uh, and they, they, they closed it permanently in 1907. So, all right, so here's the story, once upon a time. <laughs> uh, oops, there is a young, beautiful woman who lived in Paris. And she tragically drowned in the River Seine, okay? Her body was brought to the Paris morgue, as was normal back then for all the bodies that were pulled out of the river. And the forensic pathologist was struck by her beauty. That's right, it's where it gets a little creepy. <laughs> and he was so taken by how beautiful her face was that he had a mold made of it to help identify her. And her family never came and they never found out who she was. Okay, so she became known as, and Jean-Joseph, I'm gonna slaughter this, so I apologize to you and anyone else who speaks French. Les inconnus de la scene, then? No. Was it close? What is Julie? Help me with this. How do you say it? That's exactly what I said. <laughs> The unknown woman of the set. <laughs> All right. She's also known as the Mona Lisa of suicide. People thought that she had thrown herself into the river and died. <coughs> and this is the death mask. So the death mask was incredibly popular. This is like before things could go viral on the internet, right? Um, they could do so uh, through other types of art. Um, <coughs> Uh, and so the mask, you could find it, you still can find it all over Europe. It inspired musicians and, and literature and film and popular culture and people speculated who this woman was. And was she murdered? Was it suicide? And they would come up with all kinds of stories about who she was. Or was it just an accidental death? And she was, this face was wildly popular. So, of course, when you hear, it's a great story, but is it is it true? Um, so it's interesting. If you if you ask the uh, Paris police, they have no files relating to this woman. Uh, there is nothing in the archives. A body was never found when this uh, story was investigated. Um, but the mask continues to live on and um, inspires conjecture as to the woman's identity. <coughs> And uh, there is still a, um, a shop that makes this mask, a uh, family-run workshop in Paris. And uh, the mask continues to draw tourists. Uh, it was founded in 1871, uh, and it was situated very close uh, to the bank of the Seine. Um, and then it was actually closed in 2008. They, they relocated, though. And so this, this uh, face is still in production today. Um, and it may be the last known mold of, uh, of this woman. Um, now they do not know, they, they doubt that the, the cast that they currently have is the original. Those were often times uh, given between shops and exchange. Um, and the owner doesn't know really when they got it, how they got it or anything like that. It's just sort of been passed down. All right, so. That's that story. All right, it's a great story. Um, so let's let's break it down, though. Friend, let, let me pull upon. I am not a forensic pathologist. I may be odd, but I'm not that weird. Um, <laughs> so, but let's just. But uh, there was a couple, literally two questions on my boards about forensic pathology. So I'm going to use that and uh, let's break it down. Okay. So this is a woman who has gently closed eyes as if she's sleeping, a little bit of a hint of a smile on her lips. Um, and the pathologist was struck by her beauty. So thoughts, are forensic pathologists struck by the beauty of victims? <laughs> Don't answer that. No, no, people. <laughs> Stop with the awkward silence. No, of course not, please. You think of us. This is, this is 
not the face. This is not the face of a dead woman. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so when you have a drowned victim, okay, the, first of all, the face would have been distorted from decomposition, possibly from animal uh, predation, right? The, 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 the facial, facial musculature immediately, almost immediately goes flaccid after death. Corpses are not smiling at us. Uh, that would, can you imagine? The, uh, so, <laughs> the autopsies are hard enough as it is. Um, okay, so yeah, and, and what's interesting is there are lots of articles that are published even now about how do you diagnose someone who has drowned because many times there is no clues and it's really, it's like diagnosis by exclusion of literally everything else. Um, so this is a difficult diagnosis to make in modern times, let alone in the early 1900s. Um, so this is, what, this is what drowning victims really look like. As I said, I'm glad we waited until after lunch. It's not pretty. Um, so, moving on. <laughs> so how did the face, but it's still a great story and it's a great face. So how did the face get put from a death mask onto our CPR mannequin? Um, it's really uh, these three gentlemen here. So Asmund uh, Laerdal, uh, Peter Safar, and James Elam. Okay, so we'll start with Peter Safar. So he was born in Vienna uh, to a, a surgeon and, and um, a pediatrician and um, was interested in medicine actually from a very early age. Uh, but in, uh, in 1938, Austria was occupied by Germany and um, uh, Safar's uh, parents immediately lost their university jobs for refusing to join the Nazi party. And at the age of 18, uh, Peter Safar was sent to a labor camp and uh, endured six months of medical and physical abuse. And then they uh, drafted him into the German army. So the night before he is to be shipped out, um, <coughs> He was a very clever gentleman, and he took tuberculosis uh, test ointment and put it all over his body. Now, he had severe eczema to start with, and uh, the wounds that this caused on his uh, skin, basically no one wanted to go anywhere near him, and so they said, that's okay, you do not have to go and join the army. And so he basically saved himself from probably a, a, almost a certain death on the, on the battlefield. Um, he went to medical school in 1943. He was a, a paramedic um, and then became an intern in Vienna in 1949. Um, he did a fellowship in surgery at Yale and then an anesthesia residency at the University of Pennsylvania in, in Philly. Um, and then in 1954, he was an instructor uh, in anesthesiology at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And I apologize, that should be the John Hopkins Hospital <laughs> in Baltimore. Um, and then uh, moved to Baltimore City and became the chief uh, of, in the, of the Department of Anesthesiology. Now, um, James Elam, uh, that in, in 1956, he was at the American Society of, of Anesthesiologists meeting, and this is where Safar and Elam met. And, um, both of them were interested in experimentation with resuscitation. Elam had discovered that expired air delivered either by an endotracheal tube or a mask or by the mouth could maintain appropriate blood oxygenation. So they got together and, um, and in the days before the IRB had some really great experiments on people um, that luckily worked. So they said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take people, we're gonna sedate them and paralyze them on the floor. And, uh, and then we're gonna have random people that we have given CPR lessons to once, keep them alive. Um, which is ballsy. <laughs> that would, I'm sure that would get horrible. Ages 10 to 70, there's a 10-year-old doing doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on someone who's paralyzed. Oh my god. I have a 10-year-old. 
I would not let her do like mouth to mouth resuscitation on me. No way. I don't know. That, that wouldn't go well. Sorry, Gwen. If you ever see this. Love you. Uh, anyways, but it went great. And they all survived. Um, and, and, you know, neurologically they were fine too, I would assume. So, um, they, they, uh, so they presented at the Scandinavian Society of a uh, Anesthetics, and, and this is where, uh, be it fate, but uh, this is where like the three guys came together, and this is where it really got kicked off. So uh, Laerdal, um was um, a toy maker and, um, uh, and, a, and a brilliant toy maker at that. And so at this meeting, so Safar and um, had already realized that you couldn't just grab random people and sedate them and paralyze them and teach like CPR to the masses. Um, it just takes too much time amongst other issues. issues. <laughs> so he thought mannequins are probably the way to go for this. And, and, and um, Laerdal was also very interested in resuscitation because he had saved his two-year-old son from drowning at a very early age. Um, and he literally grabbed the boy from the water and put him upside down and like shook the water <coughs> out of him. Um, so which, uh, you know, there are times I wanted to grab my youngest. And <laughs> so like, I'm like, that's brilliant. Um, no, Dan, I swear she was drowning <laughs> on the couch. <laughs> so, um, but he, the, later on, all was a very successful toy maker. He pioneered the use of soft, soft plastics in making dolls and toy cars yeah. in the 1950s, and. Um, and he would go on to produce realistic wound simulators and first aid in emergency medicine. And so they asked him, they said, can you create a lifelike mannequin where you can breathe into it and it will simulate, you know, um, airway obstruction, it will simulate, you know, chest inflation with <coughs> ventilation. And that is no easy feat. It took him about two years to do it, but he did it. Um, and he realized also that you probably don't want this person to look like someone that's pulled out of a river because no one's going to want to to perform CPR on that person. So he decided to choose a classic beauty that had gone viral in the early 1900s and use her face as the face of CPR Anne. <laughs> and that is how she wound up uh, becoming that is how the face of the uh, Mona Lisa of suicide wound up on our CPR and mannequin. <laughs> so, um, in the night from somewhere between 1959 and 1960, Anne was created, was essential, essential in the promotion and education of mouth to mouth ventilation. Um, then uh, they created the, uh, the version that you could do chest compressions. They went on to make pediatric models. There are interactive uh, versions um, that actually give feedback to the trainee if you're compressing uh, hard enough or too hard. They're like, you just broke ribs, thank you. Um, in 1974, the American Heart Association and JAMA guidelines recommended that lay people should be taught CPR. And, uh, and CPR is now, everyone knows, used around the world and used successfully. So it's a great quote um, from Peter Safar. He said, death is not the enemy, but it occasionally needs help with timing. <laughs> so great quote. the creation of Resusi and uh, is the culmination of influences of war, medicine, and untimely death and technology. And I think it is really poetic uh, that, that the face of the, in <laughs> say one more time, inconnu, close. Inconnu blessing. There you go, that. Uh, <laughs> the drowned girl who appears to be sleeping restfully, and I love it that it is this face that made its way onto a simulator used to save lives, that actually does save lives of drowning victims. Um, and whoever she was, whether she is real or not, her image lives on as one of the best known faces in medicine. So there you have it.